In the early 90s, we almost got a violent and action-packed Planet of the Apes reboot dreamt up by Oliver Stone that would have starred Arnold Schwarzenegger in what then Fox president Peter Chernin called one of the best scripts he ever read. Unfortunately, the project would fall apart, giving us the Tim Burton remake instead. So let's dive in and find out why it never happened and what could have been Arnold Schwarzenegger's Planet of the Apes. Before we dive into the video, don't forget to please like and subscribe to Bullets and Blockbusters for more great content. After successfully adapting Pierre Boulle's novel, Planet of the Apes, into a blockbuster feature film, an instant classic, 20th Century Fox would squeeze four more sequels out of the IP before Ape Mania, or whatever you want to call it, would eventually dry up, with the release of the fifth film, 1973's Battle for the Planet of the Apes. Roger Ebert would call it the last gasp of a dying series, and a movie made simply to wring dollars out of any remaining ape fans. And while a short-lived live-action television series and then animated series would follow, it wouldn't be until the late 80s that Fox began thinking of resurrecting their once great franchise. The first attempt would be made by Adam Rifkin, who wrote a sequel to the original film that ignored the events of the following four films. Rifkin's film was titled Return to the Planet of the Apes, and it would have taken place when the apes had reached their version of the Roman era. A descendant of Charlton Heston's character would eventually lead a human slave revolt against the oppressive Roman-esque apes what Rifkin would describe as a sword and sandal epic very similar to Gladiator, but with apes. Unfortunately for Rifkin, Fox would cancel this project at the 11th hour after a change in leadership. Following this, Peter Jackson and Fran Walsh would pitch their own take on a sequel, with the apes going through their version of the Renaissance, which made the ape government very nervous with all the bold new artwork and ideas. Jackson and Walsh even approached Roddy McDowell, who played Cornelius and then Caesar in the original films, to return as a wise and elderly ape based based on Leonardo da Vinci. The story to the film would have seen the humans rising up in revolt and a half-human, half-ape character sheltered by the liberal apes but hunted down by the gorillas. And while the chairman of Fox, Joe Roth, was enthusiastic about the idea, the head of production at Fox was not. And after Roth left Fox, the project would fall apart. Enter Oscar winner Oliver Stone, writer of Scarface, Conan the Barbarian, and director of Platoon, Wall Street, and JFK, amongst others. Stone would pitch an absolutely bonkers idea that wouldn't be a sequel, but a reboot of the franchise. To write it, he'd hire Terry Hayes, who co-wrote both Mad Max sequels. Titled Return of the Apes, the film would have opened at Harvard, where a female biology professor named Billy Ray Diamond uncovers a global phenomenon where fetuses are aging at an accelerated rate within the womb, going through their entire life cycle before being born. Basically, they come out looking like Benjamin Button, except they're dead. Making matters worse is the frequency of these occurrences is escalating exponentially, to the extent that within a few months, live births on Earth will cease entirely, marking the end of humanity's ability to reproduce, similar to children of men. After alerting the president, Diamond is given every resource necessary to find a cure. However, she struggles to figure out the root cause of the pandemic. Enter Will Robinson, who would have been played by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Robinson works as a lab assistant at Harvard and largely keeps to himself, yet is actually a genius, not unlike Matt Damon working as a janitor in Goodwill Hunting. Robinson deduces that the cause of the pandemic is not a bacteria or a virus, Iris, like Diamond assumes, but rather something that was embedded in humanity's DNA 102,000 years ago, like a ticking time bomb that has finally gone off. The only way to stop it is at its source in the past. As he and Diamond begin to work together, Diamond deduces that Robinson is actually brilliant but disgraced scientist Dr. Robert Plant, who had been pioneering groundbreaking research in mitochondrial DNA and had theorized a way to go back in time using our genes like a map, traveling back down through our DNA, through the womb, and transcending time and space. However, due to his arrogance, his colleagues lost their lives testing his theory, one of which being his wife, abruptly ending Plant's career. Disillusioned, he abandoned his research, adopted the alias Will Robinson as a nod to being lost in space, and assumed a position as a laboratory assistant at Harvard. However, before Diamond can confront Robinson, she finds him in the middle of testing his old theory as she watches him dematerialize before her eyes as he travels back in time to the Stone Ages, emerging in Kenya, the birthplace of the human race. Race. It's not long before Robinson is captured, however, along with a primitive tribe of Paleolithic humans by an ape army led by Drac, who round up the proto-humans including Robinson and take them to Ape City. Once there, the apes take great interest in Robinson since he stands out so much from the proto-humans. A female ape scientist, Dr. Zora, wants to study him and perform experiments on him, but the apes convene the Council of Elders to decide how to proceed, eventually deciding to kill him as they fear Robinson could lead the humans to ending the apes' 
dominance over them. While awaiting his fate in his cell, Robinson befriends another human named Aragorn, the leader of the seven human tribes, and teams up with them to escape with the help of a condemned ape named Strider. This is a good time to point out that there are a ton of Lord of the Rings references and homages in this script. After Robinson escapes, Drac laments that no matter how many humans they hunt and kill, they keep breeding, replacing the population. Drac argues that what they need is a final solution. Dr. Zora mentions how apes being born in a small village far away are coming out dead, having gone through their entire life cycle in the womb. She suggests giving the disease to the proto-human tribes to stop them from being able to reproduce. Back in the present, Dr. Diamond studies Robinson's theories and decides to go back in time to help him, motivated in part because she's pregnant herself via artificial insemination and wants to save her unborn baby. Using the same calculations as Robinson, she ends up in the Stone Ages as well, reconnecting with the returning Robinson and his new friends from Ape City. Strider tells them of the ape disease, which Robinson rightly predicts will be used on the proto-humans. However, he speculates the first human, a woman and the mother of the human race, is somewhere in the Rift Valley. And once she receives the virus, she won't react the same as the proto-humans. Instead, it'll get integrated into her DNA and passed down for generations like a bomb waiting to go off, until one day, it finally does. Diamond and Robinson realize they have to find her before the apes do. Strider's scouts report that the apes are sending their army to capture the proto-humans, but the proto-humans decide to fight back, as Robinson realizes if he can stop the apes, then they won't infect the mother of the human race. To aid the proto-humans in battle, Robinson shows them how to make gunpowder and begins building gunpowder-based weapons. Tribes from all around unite to confront the ape army, as a giant battle ensues. During the battle, Diamond finds a young human girl from another tribe whose name is Eve, as Diamond deduces that she's the first human woman. Unfortunately, even with Robinson's advanced weaponry, the proto-humans are crushed, as the apes slaughter most of them and capture the rest, including Eve. Robinson and Diamond are able to avoid capture and regroup with the survivors as they lick their wounds. Robinson rallies the group as he convinces them to sneak into Ape City to save Eve and ensure the survival of the human race, which would also cure Diamond's unborn son. Back in Ape City, in Zora's laboratory, she readies to infect Eve and a few proto-humans with blood from the diseased ape babies, when Robinson bursts through the door with Diamond and takes out the guards. After they save Eve, Diamond takes her to escape, while Robinson stays behind to buy them some time by distracting the apes. Robinson then commandeers a steam-powered tank with a flamethrower that the apes use to incinerate dead proto-humans and uses it to burn down the city. As the apes try to stop him, Aragorn arrives with his reinforcements. Diamond and Eve's escape attempt, however, is blocked by a bunch of apes, as they have no choice but to return to the burning city, where Drax spots them and chases after them, as Robinson commandeers another ape steam-powered machine called the Claw that has iron jaws and can snap anything in half with ease. Basically, it's a callback to aliens, but instead of uttering Ripley's famous line, Robinson would have yelled, Keep your hands off her, you dirty ape! before grabbing Drac with the Claw and cutting him in half. The film would have ended with the destruction of Ape City, followed by Robinson delivering Diamond's baby boy, who it's presumed they'll name Adam, proving their plan worked. Robinson, however, laments that he never worked out how to get back to the present, but builds a makeshift sculpture of the head and crown of the Statue of Liberty, telling Diamond it's to make sure they never forget where they came from. So what went wrong? Well, all seemed good at first, as Philip Noyce would sign on to direct after having just finished the Tom Clancy thriller Patriot Games, while Stan Winston would be hired to design the prosthetic ape makeup, even going so far as to complete concept designs and makeup tests. However, Fox wanted a lighter film with more comedy. Basically, as producer Don Murphy would put it, screenwriter Terry Hayes wrote a Terminator film, and Fox wanted something more akin to the Flintstones. For example, one Fox executive pushed for a scene where the apes are trying to play baseball, but they're missing one important element, like the pitcher. And Schwarzenegger's character knows what they're missing and shows them, and they all start playing baseball as we know it today. Suffice it to say, writer Terry Hayes refused to include such a scene, ultimately leading to his termination. From here, director Philip Noyce would lose interest in the new, lighter direction the project was taking and left to direct The Saint, while Oliver Stone would leave as well. Schwarzenegger would stay on, though, as the script would go through additional rewrites before he'd eventually leave too, ultimately culminating in Tim Burton taking over the project. And while Terry Hayes' script may not be as great as what then Fox president Peter Chernin hailed as one of the best scripts he ever read, the thought of Schwarzenegger in his prime going back in time and using science to develop gunpowder to battle an army of apes may have been one of history's biggest missed opportunities when it comes to cinematic guilty pleasures. Thanks for watching everybody and don't forget to like and subscribe to Bullets and Blockbusters for more great content.